When I say I love you, I'm not just making you my forever companion. I'm making you my best friend, my last dance, and my only hope. When I say I love you, I'm not just expressing a feeling, I'm solidifying a commitment that will take my entire life to show you. When I say I love you, I'm not claiming to have all the answers, but to be there together to ask the right questions. When I say I love you, I'm not just repeating till death to us part. I'm saying I'll be with you forever in this life and our life to come. When I say I love you, I'm not just voicing words. I'm telling you that I've been surprised and challenged and shocked and humbled realizing that soulmates do exist. When I say I love you, I'm not just giving you human love. I'm attempting to pour out God's unconditional, sacrificial love. When I say I love you, I am promising to honor and serve you because you are the rifle of my dreams. A blessing and a gift from God. To you, I open my heart. I don't know what the future holds, how long your barrel life will be, or how much gas you'll spit in my face under heavy sustained fire and high cyclic rates. But I know I do not have a future without you. And so just know that when I say I love you, I mean I love you. Anyway, we just hit the streets talking culture and I'm excited to share the conversations with you all over at the Exodus companies. What I find to be true is that we're being lied to. We are being told that we are against each other. When in fact, often we are more aligned than what we realize. How often do you find yourself believing the narrative of mainstream media only to prove it wrong in the real world? Our objective at the Exodus Companies is to speak to culture, to share a message of hope and personal excellence and responsibility, and encourage everyone to stop outsourcing positive change to the political class. The best way that you can help us to spread that message is to check out the podcast and share it and these videos with your friends. If you are blessed enough to do so, consider monetarily supporting us at our various brands by purchasing some of the products that we manufacture and retail. All the links will be in the description below. I will also cover a special discount for you at the end of this video. Thank you all for your support. Let's talk about machine guns. Yeah. So what's the deal with machine guns? Why can't you as a citizen own one? Why are they so heavily regulated? And at what point did Americans forgo their right to own and possess them? Heck, why is this even worth talking about in the first place? I'm really glad you asked that question. To really understand how I form the basis for my belief in the human right to own firearms, I think it's worthwhile to take a bit of a historic look at my home state. Pennsylvania was a critical player in the founding of the United States. The rich, diverse population along with the sheer size of the state created influence in our young nation. Pennsylvania had the ability to completely sway the discussions surrounding our human natural rights and many key figures arose to the stage during the debate of the union from Pennsylvania. The framers writings lay the groundwork to solidify their stance in the right to own military arms by the citizen populace. It is clear that our right to own firearms is a natural human right. It's not a privilege granted by the government. But for now, I want us to analyze the Pennsylvania state constitution to lay this foundation for this argument. The first Pennsylvania state constitution was ratified on September 28, 1776. I want us to take note of two things. First, the Pennsylvania constitution was ratified over a decade prior to the federal constitution. Second, let's read that language of the right to bear arms that existed in this constitution that predated the United States. Chapter 1, Section 13, that the people have a right to bear arms for the defense of themselves and the state 
and as standing armies in the time of peace are dangerous to liberty, they ought not be kept up, and that the military should be kept under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. In 1790, Pennsylvania adopted a new constitution. Inside this constitution in Article 9, Section 21, it states that the right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. The war of politics is a war of words, meanings, deceit, half-truths, and sometimes blatant lies. It's why we see politicians standing up professing knowledge of firearms, clearly being totally and incomprehensibly ignorant of the firearms that they supposedly despise. And this is why owning the war of words is critically important. It's why I embrace the term assault weapon when I used to in the past fight it. The reality is our God-given right to firearms guarantees us the protection against infringement by the government for ownership of military weaponry, including supplemental gear for combat roles. Recognize this as I discuss and demonstrate machine guns, know that all supplemental gear is also protected. The federal government has defined the term machine gun as follows. Any weapon which shoots, is designed to shoot, or can be readily restored to shoot automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. In other words, if you press and hold the trigger rearward and the firearm continuously fires rounds out of the barrel until the trigger is no longer depressed, it's a machine gun. The federal government has also classified certain components of machine guns to be themselves classified as a machine gun. While most people would think of belt-fed weapons or larger vehicle-mounted weapons as machine guns, the reality is many weapons that could previously be owned and were readily owned by Americans are classified as machine guns and as such are virtually impossible for regular citizens to own. This is not accidental. This was an intentional move by the federal government to further restrict citizens' ability to practice true individual liberty. Machine guns matter, and I don't say that as some sort of joke or some clever quip. The ability to possess the exact arms of the standing armies of our world is the only true balance against absolute tyranny. But don't take my word for it. I'd prefer to simply quote some of the founders, the framers, the ones who knew firsthand the danger of an all-powerful regime. I could share dozens of examples, but let me share one from Tench Cox. The power of the sword, say the minority of Pennsylvania, is in the hands of Congress. My friends and countrymen, it is not so, for the powers of the sword are in the hands of the yeomanry of America from 16 to 65. The militia of these free commonwealths entitled to and accustomed to their arms when compared to any possible army must be tremendous and irresistible. Who are the militia? Are they not ourselves? Is it feared then that we shall turn our arms each man against his own bosom? Congress have no power to disarm the militia. Their swords and every other terrible implement of the soldier are the birthright of an American. What clause in the state or federal constitution hath given away that important right? The unlimited power of the sword is not in the hands of either the federal or state governments, but where I trust in God it will ever remain, in the hands of the people. Our history is ripe with examples of humans' right to own all arms for provision, protection, and defense of liberty. This isn't a left and right concept, as we are told by our officials. This is a basic understanding that human institutions are flawed and the natural tendency of them is to end in failure, abuses, and tyranny against their people. So what happened? At what point did we forsake our rights? At what point did we turn in our guns to the demands of the federal government? That story is a long, complex history of slow chisels chipping away at these rights. It's an extensive and painful look back into history. But let's summarize it. 
Prior to 1934, if you wanted a machine gun, you could simply purchase a machine gun. You didn't need to ask permission, you just did it. And Americans did, in fact, own common machine guns, just like you own modern fighting rifles today. But the government in the early 1900s went radically corrupt. This era of new deals and new regulations brought upon us a reality of what was to come, a pathway towards total tyranny, one that continues to this day. The 18th Amendment in 1919 banned the sale of alcoholic beverages in the United States. The government once again utilized its vast, expansive arm of tyranny to overregulate the citizens. The result was an increase in crime and the birth of what is called organized crime. This was a new era of criminal enterprise that exploded in a new market of restricted and illegal merchandise. As a result of these explosions of crime and the blatant disobedience towards the 18th Amendment by the citizens of the United States, the government ultimately abolished prohibition by passing the 21st Amendment to the Constitution, recognizing the failed attempt at regulation of the citizenry. The 21st Amendment was ratified on December 5, 1933, but the government had already created a pathway for the rampant organized crime that existed in cities like Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and more. Organized crime that largely resulted from the government's regulation in the first place. So what was the response by our elected leaders? On June 26, 1934, the 73rd Congress enacted what was to be known as the National Firearms Act. This was one of their proposed solutions to the wave of crime that was occurring in our nation's cities. After much debate, our leaders settled on a tax and register scheme that did not outright ban the possession of machine guns by regular citizens. It simply taxed them and registered them with the federal government. This avoided a much larger, more complex constitutional legal battle surrounding the outright banning of a segment of firearms. This act included machine guns, short barrel rifles, short barrel shotguns, and silencers. At the time of passing the NFA, a $200 tax was imposed as well as a requirement to register any weapon that falls under the NFA with the federal government. At the time, a $200 tax stamp equates to about $4,000, a price that most responsible citizens simply couldn't afford. Upon further research, I found that the average salary in 1934 was between $1,400 a year and $4,000 a year, depending on your state and your source of the data. Although they did not ban machine guns, they priced most Americans out of the ability to own them. Compare that to today's time, where the average salary is around $54,000 per year. That's like the government taking your right to assemble in your church unless you register your church and then each member pays $54,000 for the right to assemble or one year of your salary. That registration meant the federal government had complete oversight and knowledge of anyone possessing an NFA firearm, assuming they followed the law and registered it and paid that tax. Many did not. Unironically, the exact method that dismantled the Volstead Act could have been used to abolish the NFA immediately, but Americans gave their freedoms away. And it's sad to think that Americans were more concerned with their alcohol consumption than protecting their human right to own the exact same weapons that the government owns. But this was only the beginning of a slow chiseling of our rights. In 1968, the Gun Control Act removed the ability of someone who currently possesses an unregistered NFA firearm to have a pathway to register said firearm. In 1986, President Reagan signed into law legislation ironically titled Firearm Owners Protection Act. This act further defines suppressor components as suppressors that need to be registered and prohibited the transfer and possession of machine guns. An exception was made to this regulation, of course, for government agencies and officers and possessors of registered machine guns that were previously registered prior to May 19, 1986. The effect of this intentionally limited the supply of legal registered machine guns, thus increasing the value to collectors of those that were. This is where the term transferable machine guns originate. Your government, for your good, created laws which created violence and organized crime, which failed to actually stop what they desired to stop. They then removed that regulation, but continued further regulation, which did not hinder illegal ownership of said guns, 
you know, once again, for your good. Despite no evidence over time that criminals obey law, and despite ample data showing that restricting good citizens from owning guns does not reduce crime, we continue down this path of hyper-regulation of our rights to this day. Most ironically to me is comparing Chicago homicides in the 1920s through the 30s to today. In 1930, Chicago had a homicide rate of 14.6 per 100,000. In 2021, that number was 29.6. Population in 1930 was 3.37 million. 2021, it was 2.69. The federal government broke your legs and then was kind enough to sell you a wheelchair and crutches. Only the sale wasn't voluntary. They required you to comply or threatened to break your arms if you did not. My broader point to this conversation is that gun rights are human rights, not just American rights. We have ample evidence of this fact, not only in nature around us, but in the writings of the people who framed the government that we have today. We had a pathway to further expand and understand our rights, yet the populace openly embraced regulation proposed by the government. Rather than refusing compliance immediately at the enactment of the NFA, we obeyed. We did not listen to the writings of Cox. We ignored the writings of Madison. We forgot the meaning behind the Declaration of Independence. Pennsylvanians were convinced shall not be questioned isn't really that important. We must realize that the war of words and ideas is a generational battle, one that is constantly fought against our freedom. Our freedoms will not exist if we do nothing. They are guaranteed to die. That is history. We are in a generational psychological battle of ideas, and if we don't change the culture now, the few rights that we still hold will die as well. So the truth is, you can own a machine gun just like this even today, but the only ones you can legally purchase are ones that were manufactured and registered prior to May 19, 1986. They also must have been registered with the federal government and a $200 tax paid prior to this date. You then must be fingerprinted, fill out a lengthy application, send photographs in for approval, pay a $200 tax, and you end up waiting about a year for approval after you spent 50 grand on a highly collectible gun that should be as ordinary as a salt shaker on your table. The government conned us out of our rights. A group of firearms that is functionally the same as every other modern semi-automatic that is well within your rights has been taken from you, taxed from you, without your consent. And I want you to ask yourself why. Why would the government desire so much to regulate select fire weapons? The answer is actually very simple. The less you are armed, the more compliant you'll be. The end goal is a compliant, malleable populace. It is your human right to own machine guns, just like every other firearm. This isn't about an obsession with machine guns. This is about a concept of liberty and a belief that human rights trump fear and government's only task that they are good at is creating problems that they then suck at solving. We can continue to allow politicians to pillage us or we can simply demand our rights back. It's up to us to demand all of those rights back. Our culture desperately needs you and I to be living by example. One great way to do that is to live by what we call the seven F's of culture. These seven F's are faith, family, finance, fitness, fulfillment, freedom, and fruition. Focusing on these seven aspects of our lives is how we become more excellent and ultimately impact those around us. We no longer will fall prey to outsourcing a cultural revival to leaders or politicians. We know that we hold the power to revive our culture and make our communities stronger. If you want to share that message, consider grabbing our apparel at the Exodus Company's website. We've got a link to that website down below and a link to the Exodus Company's podcast in the description. If you sign up to the newsletter in the link in our description, we'll also send you a massive discount for the Exodus Company's website. One last bit of good news. We have extended a promotion where if you buy one of our select Steel Target systems and use the code in the description down below, you'll receive free pure silver one ounce rounds details are down in the description below it's available only while our supplies last get equipped let us invest in you with real money and then get out and affect change in the culture around you